Well, good morning. If you would open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians is a book packed with life-sustaining, life-envisioning verses. So much so that we've decided to take this book very slowly, a few verses at a time, because each section is, is so full of rich content that we didn't want to force ourselves to limit focus on each section to merely a point in a message. We wanted to make a whole message out of each section of every few verses. So that's why we're going so slow through Philippians. I hope it's serving you, it's certainly serving me. We're going to be looking this morning at verses 25 and 26. It brings to a conclusion Paul's biographical section at the beginning of Philippians, what's going on in his life and how he's interpreting it. But in order to understand the context, I'm going to begin reading in verse 21. And let's remember as we read that this is God's authoritative, unchanging, life-giving word. These words are God speaking to us. And he is re-speaking them into our hearts this morning. Let's be conscious of the fact that our God is speaking. Philippians 1.21 For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Lord, bless the preaching of these words. For decades now, children have been entertained by one Thomas the Train. Sure, many of you, perhaps when you were children, or certainly your children now, have watched Thomas and his friends on the magical island of Sodor try to be really useful engines. And if you've never watched the show, being a really useful engine is the ultimate ambition of a train on the island of Sodor. The goal is to be a really useful engine. The opposite of being really useful is to cause confusion and delay. And when trains are mischievous, or when they fail to fulfill their responsibilities, or they try to do something they're not capable of doing, they typically cause confusion and delay. But then often there's some repentance that takes place, and they acknowledge that they were wrong, and Thomas leads the charge. And by the end, there's often some commendation that some train has been a really useful engine. And you can just see them beaming in the little locomotive pride when that commendation comes down from Sir Topham Hatt, the owner of the railway. Now, if you were to say what your great ambition is, what would you say it is? Is it your ambition with the life, the days, the moments that remain to you to be a really useful Christian? Is that your ambition? Do you want to be a really useful Christian? I think Paul, in this passage, basically gives us this ambition, both through his own example and what he intends to do in ministry to the Philippians, to hold out for us this goal, to be a really useful Christian, that the remaining life we have is not random, it's not by chance, it's not merely for the completion of a bucket list, it's not merely to complete our personal desires, it's to be useful to make progress in God's purposes and God's kingdom. It's to be a really useful. You might think of these verses as the anti-stagnation verses in Philippians. They're the anti-complacency uh, verses. So if, if you struggle with complacency, and I do, 
where your spiritual life reaches a certain stagnation and you notice your mind drifting to non-spiritual goals for the rest of your life? Financial goals, home maintenance goals, goals of, of personal achievement, and you've, you've lost sight of God's purpose for you? Well, it could be that this passage is intended to speak directly to that complacency. And all of us have that temptation. We're all tempted to cause confusion and delay by pursuing our own interests rather than being really useful in God's kingdom. Well, this passage speaks directly to us. It, it breaks down, if you look down at your Bibles, it breaks down basically into two sections. You notice in verse 26 it says, so that... You notice that word, so that? So there's a, an ultimate conclusion that Paul is, is wanting this discussion to reach, so that. So that's the second point. And the first point talks about his expectation that he will remain and continue in partnership with the Philippians. If you remember, he's been talking about how he's in prison, and he's faced with this hypothetical choice. He doesn't actually have power over it, but he's just musing in front of them. He's saying, what, what would I choose? If I could choose, what would I want? For me to live as Christ, living is all about Christ Jesus, and dying is gain because I'm set free from this body of sin and the temptations of this world and the labor of my ministry, and I can just be with Christ all the time. But, but what am I supposed to choose? I want to go. I want to be with Christ. I want to be done with the toils and trials here. But I'm also aware that if I remain, that's necessary for your good. So he sees before him these two possibilities, remaining and bearing fruit for Christ or departing through martyrdom, likely, and being in the presence of Christ. And though he has a personal preference, he is also aware that likely, in this case, he's been given some insight that probably there is some good work that God still has for him to do. And so he says, if you notice in verse 24, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And this begins to earn, insert a theme that's going to be present throughout Philippians, that the Christian is to be aware of the needs and benefit of others. They are to be thinking about others. They are to be using their lives up for the good of others. And Paul is so convinced of this, so convinced that it's necessary that God use him in their lives, that he even expects that he will not be martyred, that he'll be released from prison because God has plans for the remainder of his life. So here's the two points I want to hit this morning. The remaining life and the resulting glory. The remaining life and the resulting glory. Let's look at the remaining life in verse 25. Paul is convinced that since his remaining in the flesh, non-martyred Paul, is necessary for the Philippians and likely for the other churches he serves. And he has such an expectation here that he knows, he says, that he will remain. There is life that he still has to live. God has plans for him still. He is not going to be allowed to have his desire. He's going to have to lay that down and continue laboring for the good of the churches. And he's going to continue with them off. Notice that in your Bibles. And the result of this is going to be their progress and joy in the faith. I want to zero in just on Paul, and then we'll talk about the Philippians. What Paul views as the purpose for his still being alive is instructive for us. The only reason that Paul thinks he's going to remain alive is so that he can be useful to the Lord. Paul views his future outside of jail not as an occasion for him to experience personal preferences and maybe a certain uh, sightseeing view of life. No, the only reason in Paul's mind that he's not dead is so that he can be useful to the Lord, in this case, for the Philippians, for their progress and joy in the faith. I think there's something instructive about that for all of us. Now, none of us are apostles, but all of us are Christians who are also claimed by the Lord. And we should, all of us, view our remaining life with the same expectation. If we are still alive, it's because God has a purpose for us to serve him. So, so let's just think about this week, just to break it down very, very simply. 
Do you expect to be alive on Friday of this week? Now, we don't know when the time comes. We don't know when the Lord will, will drop down and, and carry us up to himself. We, we don't know when that happens. But do you expect currently, are you making plans expecting to be alive on Friday? Now, I would say most of us probably would say yes. In Paul's mind, if you are expecting to be alive, the reason for that life is usefulness to the Lord. That's the only reason for being alive. Usefulness to the Lord. The, the reason you're still living is because you have stuff to get done for Jesus. That's what Paul would say. If you have nothing to do for Jesus, there's no reason for you to be alive. You might as well be with him. He doesn't actually want to be alive anymore. He wants to go and be with Christ. But he's aware that he thinks Christ has still work for him to do. But I want to back up and notice this assumption. Paul's assumption is that our remaining days are to be useful in the kingdom. We're to labor for the good of his church, for his ultimate glory. There is to be a, a positive, fruitful effect of our days. Now, I, I love this passage because it reminds me of people that I think are much more godly than me in thinking about the usefulness of their life. I've told my wife for years, she is more godly than me in thinking about the usefulness of an individual day than I am. I, I tend to think about how, how can I get through this day doing as little as possible. She tends to think, how much can we get done today? I think that's a much more godly way of thinking. And there's others among you that are examples to me as well. Do we think about life as being useful to God? Or do we think of it as being acknowledging God, but accomplishing our own purposes? For a while, when we lived in Phoenix, we had this basically <laughs> barely hanging on lemon tree. That was a lemon tree in name only. It didn't actually produce any lemons, but we were convinced that it actually was a lemon tree just with no lemons. And so we, we watched it for years, and there's, there's rarely things sadder than a fruit tree with no fruit. It, it sort of brings to mind, what is the point of you? What is the point? You're not a particularly beautiful tree just as a tree. If we just wanted a green thing in the corner, we could have found much better looking ones. You kind of hang and they kind of sag. You ever seen a lemon tree? Uh, you know, without lemons, they're, they're not the greatest sight in the world. If they're, they're uncropped and I don't know what I'm doing, pruning trees. So it, it's just sort of there, sticking out in the side of the yard. Had no lemons for years. And then abruptly, it started to, to produce lemons. And then it was, it was glorious. It was producing fruit for our family. We could enjoy, we could use it, we could have lemonade. You know, sometimes I think we look at our life and, and what we want for our life is different than what God has called us to. And spiritually speaking, we can sometimes be like a, a lemon tree that's mostly focusing on reaching for other venues and, and options and goals and vacations and, and pleasures and enjoyments. But the whole point of a lemon tree is to produce lemons. And spiritually speaking, we have to look at ourselves soberly and say, what is the point of this life if we're not bearing fruit for God? It, it, it's one of the points of the book of Ecclesiastes. If you read Ecclesiastes, you know, look, one of the points of that is, look, look, pursuing earthly things are all temporary. Even good things are temporary. You can enjoy them, enjoy the, the pleasures of life. There's nothing wrong with them, but, but ultimately they're temporary. There's nothing wrong with, with making as much money as you can do in a godly way. There's nothing wrong with, with enjoying pleasures like movies and television and books. But if we're thinking of those as the ultimate reason we're on earth, we're missing something of God's calling. Paul sees his remaining days as having a calling of usefulness to God and to his people. He wants to be a fruit-bearing fruit tree, not just a tree that doesn't bear fruit. He wants to be useful. He views the very meaning of his life as bearing fruit in God's church and for God's glory. That's the very reason he's alive. So let me, let me ask us a very difficult question. 
If you were to say, the whole reason I'm going to be alive this next week is to bear fruit for God, how would you order your week? If you were to say, the entire reason my heart is beating right now is to bear fruit, to be useful for God, how would you order your week? How would you order your finances? How would you order your, your giving percentage? How would you order your, your relationship with other believers? How would you order your next conversation with an, a non-Christian friend? H how would you have that next conversation with the, the barber or the hairdresser? How would you have that next conversation with the guy checking you out at HEB? How would you have those conversations? How would you plan your, your, your financial future in terms of retirement? How would you plan those things if you were to honestly say, the whole reason for my existence is to be useful to the king? That's Paul. That's Paul's view. And as we've said over and over again, Paul is unique in his authority and in his office. We are not apostles, but he calls the churches to follow his example in Christian living. So in their own ways, they are likewise to say, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. It will be a gift of the Lord to bring this life to a close. When my heart stops beating, it will be a kindness of God to me. Because my labors and struggles in this flesh-bound world will be over and I'll be free to just see his face let set free from the entanglements of sin of myself and of others. And I'll be allowed to just gaze at him and, and worship him without that sin. But in the time that remains, I'm to be useful. And actually, the same vision extends to the Philippians as well. If you notice, what... Paul wants to do with his remaining life, it has implications for God's calling on their life as well. The life that remains for them has a purpose. Notice this. To remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, that I will remain. I know that I will continue with you all. For what? Not primarily for your happiness in seeing me again, not even primarily because I'm your friend and you don't want me to suffer, primarily so that you can make progress and have joy in the faith. Now, when Paul says this, I think it, it, it not so subtly implies a purpose for their lives as well. What is God's purpose for the Philippians? That they would have progress. I think that's in the knowledge and the will of God in Christ for their lives in fulfilling in their lives the calling of Christ upon them. He's about to, to go into this next section where there's the first command. He says, live in a way that is always worthy of the gospel. Stand fearlessly before your opponents. Serve one another in humility. Love one another and stop quarreling. He's about to, to go into all of the callings of the letter. And so I think the progress is explained as he walks through. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means to believe in Jesus and to reflect in your everyday life what Jesus has called you to be. So you're to make progress in knowing him and in reflecting him. There is a purpose for the Philippians. Paul says, so great is God's intention that you make progress in the gospel and that you have joy that he is even going to restrain the greatest human power on earth, the Roman government, so that your progress can be brought about. Listen, God never intends Christians to stagnate. He never intends Christians to stop growing, to stop evaluating how more of their life can conform to the calling of the gospel, how they can know more of him and what he has done in Christ and him crucified. He, he never calls Christians to say, I have learned and grown enough. Nor should we. Now, be honest with yourselves. And I, I'm going to speak especially to my, my mature Christian friends. You've been Christians for a lengthy period of time, decades. I want to speak especially to you. Be honest with yourself. Isn't it tempting to say the hard growth is over? The, the, the hard-working spiritual growth is over. I fought my biggest battles 
And now there's just the fine tuning of a few avoiding some nasty, persistent habits. Isn't that temptation if you're a middle-aged or an elderly Christian, or you've been a Christian for some decades, to think the fine-tuning is all that's left and the major battles of growing in faith and the knowledge of the gospel is over? Perhaps when you were young, you, you read voraciously to understand the faith, but it's been years since you labored over some new bit of theology. Perhaps you used to study the scriptures every day, but now you've drifted to where it's only occasional and not particularly emotional in your study. Perhaps you thought about some deep doctrine at one point, but it's been years since you labored to learn and to study some new element of what Christ did to save you. Look, all of us face this temptation, and what Paul is saying to the Philippians is, so important is your progress, your usefulness in God's kingdom in terms of growth, that even Rome itself will be stopped from keeping me in prison so that I can contribute to it. Look, it is, it is deadly for a church when her most mature historic members stop thinking about progress and usefulness and start thinking about comfort and preservation must not be the case must not be the case and not only progress but joy joy and progress this isn't duty and drudgery this isn't a useful and morose engine this is a joyful project this is paul saying look i I, i'm called by god to contribute your joy in the faith there should be a growing and experiential joy for those who are already believers but are continuing to experience the joy of the gospel. Listen, if, if you are a, a new believer, God has called you to make progress in knowing him and in reflecting him and progress in joy in the gospel. If, if you're not experiencing joy, if you're not reflecting joy in Christ, that, that you're not understanding God's purpose for you, God does not want grumpy but growing Christians. Neither does he want joyful and complacent Christians. He wants rejoicing and growing Christians. That's the Christian that is useful to the king. Let me invite you to evaluate your joy. So important is the Philippians' joy that Paul is convinced he'll have to lay down his desire for martyrdom and that he'll have to continue laboring and that God himself will do a supernatural act and get him out of prison. Why? Because God wants the Philippians rejoicing. Listen, we can't separate joy from our calling in Christ. We can't separate joy from God's definition of usefulness. What God defines as our purpose is a joyful purpose because of who Christ is and what he's done. Listen, the remaining life that we have is defined as useful in terms of our progress and our joy, according to this passage. The successful Christian life in the remaining days that we have is to be joyful and making progress in the faith. That is the definition of the remaining time that we have. So fathers, let that be the definition of your successful discipleship of your family. Mothers, let that be the definition of how you reflect Christ to your children. Are you joyful and are you making progress in the faith? Young people, if you're eight, nine, ten, you're out there, let me tell you something about Jesus. He wants you to be growing in maturity, in obedience and godliness, and joyful in Jesus. He does not want a Christianity, and if this is the, the next generation I'm speaking to, if you're under 12 years old, let me speak to you. God wants you to be joyful because you know Jesus, that he died for your sins, and that he has a purpose for your life. The remaining days are intended by God to be days of joy, not superficial happiness, joy and progress in the faith. The remaining life. The remaining life has a goal, and that goal is the resulting glory. The resulting glory. Look what Paul says. So that, what's the result 
of him being released and so that he can continue to minister, their progress and join the faith is the fruit of that ministry. It's so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So that in me, so Paul's going to be the occasion or the, the cause that they're going to have an abundance, ample, that word means an abundance, overflowing reason to glory in Christ Jesus. That's the sphere of their glory because of my coming to you again. Here's, here's what Paul's saying. Paul believes he's going to be released from prison. He's going to be set free to go continue to minister. He'll minister to churches, and Philippians will be one of them. And when he does that, they are going to see that deliverance as a work of God, a cause for joyful celebration, and evidence that God has been faithful to his people yet again. And they will glory in that evidence of God's salvation of Paul practically, and they'll glory in this new life that they have in Christ Jesus. That, that phrase, in Christ Jesus, it's used throughout the New Testament. It, it speaks of our union with Christ. The idea here is that a Christian, when they are born again, they are brought into a new existence where Christ defines everything about them. It's not that they're sinless. It's just that they are now identified completely with him. And so when they glory, what they're saying is, in this new existence in Christ, I am able to celebrate his mighty acts on behalf of his people. And one of those acts is about to happen when Paul was released from prison. And I'm able to celebrate that mighty act in such a way that I am glorying in this new life that I have in Christ Jesus. I'm declaring that he's trustworthy, that he's capable, that he's able to do mighty things among us. So what Paul says is, here's the result of my being set free. I'm going to be set free. I'm going to work for your progress and joy in the faith. And the result of God doing that mighty act is glory in Christ Jesus. Because contrary to the Jewish expectations of the day, contrary to the Roman power of the day, God is able to bring about this miraculous deliverance from jail in such a way that his people can glory in him, can declare him to be worthy of their ultimate trust, that he is worthy of their confidence because yet again he has done what is necessary for them contrary to all human power and human will and human desire. He is able to accomplish this mighty act for the good of his church by delivering Paul. And the result is a worshipful declaration that he is glorious. That's the end game of Paul's deliverance. Paul is saying, look, ultimately, the main goal is the glory of Jesus Christ, the glory of the church in what he's done. And so though I personally would love to go to heaven right now, Paul says, my, my suspicion is that he's going to deliver me so that he can receive glory from yet again doing what his church needs for their good. Paul is always doing this. If you notice in the epistles, and sometimes we just kind of skip over it, he's always attaching everything ultimately to a, a declaration of glory in Jesus. You notice how he's always doing that? Little phrases like, to the glory of his name, to the glory of his grace. Every knee will bow to the glory of Jesus. There's these little phrases that they, they kind of point us forward. A Christian, when they think about the future and their remaining life, their main ambition should be that in Christ Jesus, there is this celebration, this welling up of declarations of glory. 
That he is worthy because of what he's done. He's worthy because he has rescued his people yet again. He's provided what they need. He's contributing to their joy and their progress. He is worthy. He is lifting up his own name and exalting himself through what he has done for his people. The glory of Jesus Christ and glorying in Christ is the end game of all that God does in the church. And Rome and the Jewish antagonists in this case and the limitations of Paul's physical ability, they are no matter for God's intention to bring about his church glorying in Christ Jesus. Now, we need this vision. Here's why. I believe that in our country, especially in our world, there is a way of thinking about following Jesus that is similar to Choosing a religion that serves you privately, but doesn't have a lot more meaning than comforting your spiritual side of your psyche. But what Paul is constantly saying is, we are connected to something that is above and beyond all of the cosmos, that is the ultimate end that all things are driving towards. We are connected to something that is far beyond anything we could grasp or imagine. We are connected to something that is magnificent, that is, is, is supernatural, it is heavenly, it is glorious, it is glorying in Christ Jesus, the head of all things, the savior of sinners, the redeemer of rebels, the one who has come to earth and has rescued sinners, and now we are part of his worship chorus. Now, let me speak to you. If you're here and you're, 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 you're not a, a Christian friend, you're, you're a friend that's here with your Christian friends. You know about Jesus, obviously. You know about Christianity, but you, you don't believe in him right now as your Savior. What this is talking about is basically a missionary who is in jail because he's been following Jesus and people don't like that. And having followed Jesus and he's in jail, he, he wants to go serve his friends by talking to them about the Bible. And he's convinced that he's going to be set free from jail. And you can imagine why he thinks when that happens, his friends would be excited and they would, they would worship God for having brought that about because it would be a miracle. It would be, humanly speaking, impossible. Listen, the, the reason that he would be so excited about this is because he loves Jesus and he wants people to know about the glory of Jesus. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, let me tell you about Jesus. This person, Christ Jesus, that they're glorying in, that they're excited about, they're going to worship him for letting Paul out of jail. He, he is God himself. And he came to this earth you can travel right now to the place where he lived. He was God that became man. And being man, he died on a cross, which is God's required punishment for sinners like you and like me. And having died on that cross, he paid for their sin, and then he rose from the dead and ascended up into heaven. That's where he is right now. This is not spiritual mysticism. This is literal fact. He is literally in heaven. He is actually, factually in heaven. This one that died for sinners and rose from the grave. He is in heaven. And this is the person that Paul is saying he can't wait to worship when he is set free from jail to serve his people. And if you're here and you're, you're not a Christian, let me encourage you to know this Jesus as well. Because if you confess your sins, you can believe in this Jesus, and you also can worship him, not for delivering Paul, but for delivering you. And that deliverance is even more amazing. Paul expects to be delivered from a physical jail cell. And he's saying the church is going to celebrate his glory for having done that. You can be delivered from the chains of your sins, from the bondage of your rebellion against God, from your habits of wickedness. You can be delivered from the punishment you deserve. And when that happens, the church also will glory in Christ Jesus. 
That's why we want you to believe in Jesus. Not, not because we, we just want a bigger church or we need more people to help with the potluck. That, that's not what we need. We, we want you to be delivered to Jesus so that we as a family together can celebrate that in the same way that he delivered Paul from that prison, you were delivered from your prison. And we can celebrate in glory in Christ Jesus again. Every time God does a miraculous work, it should result in the church glory in Christ Jesus, and no more so than when a prisoner to sin is delivered into grace. For Christians, I think this passage calls out to us. It calls out to little Christian steam engines that sort of steam around and around in a circle of self-indulgence and complacency. And he calls them to get off of that track and get back on to being useful for his kingdom, like Paul was. He calls them to see their life as having a purpose of progress and joy in the faith. He calls them to remember they're part of something much grander than some railway station. They're part of a universal, wide commitment to the glory of Jesus Christ. Husbands, you are a part of a universal, wide plan to bring about the glory of Jesus Christ. One little bit of progress and one little bit of joy at a time. Wives, you are a part of a cosmic plan to bring glory to Jesus Christ. One little bit of spiritual progress and one little will-powered expression of joy at a time. Teenagers, you are called to be part of a cosmic plan. There is nothing more exciting than the cosmic glory of Jesus Christ. You can be a part of this. You can join us in this. You don't have to spend your life looking like a lemon tree with no lemons. You can spend your life producing glory for Jesus Christ. Older saints, Paul did not have many more years to live when he wrote these verses. He probably had fewer years to live than you do. But in his mind, those years are going to be dedicated to be useful for the glory of Jesus Christ for the progress of his people, for their experience of joy in the gospel. Paul has no notion of spiritual retirement. Of course, our bodies age. Of course, we are less robust than we once were. Of course, we're less energetic. Of course. But spiritually speaking, whatever energy we do have, whatever remaining life we do have, Paul would say, invest it Give it to be useful to the king for the progress and joy of the faith of ourselves and of others and ultimately for the celebration of God's glory as he continues to do his mighty acts in the church. God has put us in a very particular track with a very particular job. We are not to stand still. We're not to go in a circle. We are to make progress and be useful for his kingdom. Because he rescued us from the junk heap of sin and wrath and set us in the kingdom of light where our greatest ambition is to hear from him, well done, useful one in my kingdom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to be useful to you. We want to make progress in the faith. We want to have joy. We want to see our remaining days with purpose. Lord, we want to see tomorrow morning with purpose. 
Wednesday afternoon, Friday night. We want to see it with purpose. Lord, I pray for anyone who is aware of some area of complacency, spiritual complacency. Lord, I pray that you would use these words to inspire them to make progress again, to experience joy again. Lord, I pray for anyone who feels like their, their life is meaningless. It's pointless. It's not going anywhere. I pray, Lord, that they would see this calling as part of your worship chorus to be the ultimate meaning and purpose. Please, Lord, protect us from spiritual laziness and stagnation. Use us, Lord. Use this church. Please, Lord, use us for your glory. Use us so that we have to grow. Use us in our joy to draw people to you. Use us in our witness. Use us in our worship. Lord, use us, Lord. We're not holding back parts of our life from you. Use us, Lord. Use us up. Lord, let us, let us not outlive our usefulness to you. Use us up, Lord. And then take us to be with you. Use us up, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.